Welcome to week three. So today we're going to cover tabular data. So when I say tables, what I mean is, remember that when we talked about data abstractions, there were three major forms of data, tabular data, network and tree data, and spatial data. So today we're gonna to focus on tabular data. An important idea here is uh, the idea that there's different kinds of attributes. There's key attributes and value attributes. So a key attribute, we can think of that as independent in the language of statistics. Um, in the language of computer science, what we're doing is we're using it as a unique index to look up items. So you can think of it as uh, like an index in a multidimensional array. Now, if you just have simple flat tables, then there's only one key to worry about. Sometimes that key is even implicit uh, rather than explicit. Um, but if you had a multidimensional table, then you would need multiple keys to look up a single cell. Uh, and remember, we're calling the columns of a simple flat table the uh, attributes, and we're calling the rows the items. Um, so what we then think about as a value attribute uh, in the language of stats, that's a dependent attribute, that is the value in some cell in that table. Now, the reason that we're focused on this vocabulary of key and value is that it's really instructive to think about the design of visual encodings according to the number of keys that we have. Um, whether there's no keys at all, or one key, or two keys. Um, so let's dive in. So let's start with the scatter plot. Of course, you've all seen these. Uh, what's going on when we try to analyze them, though? So what we're doing with the scatter plot, it's the sort of classic example of where we are expressing a value. So you've got some sort of you know, quantitative magnitudes that you've got, and you don't actually have any keys. You just have values. Each of the two axes of the scatter plot is allowing you to express a specific value. Um, and so what we're going to do, and we're going to do this today and then for many days in the future as well, uh, we're going to go through and systematically analyze these idioms according to um, what kind of data they have, the marks, the channels, what kinds of tasks they're good for, the scalability uh, in terms of a uh, screen that's a thousand by a thousand pixels. So let's start in on this with scatter plots. All right, so what's our data? Well, we have two quantitative attributes. Uh, our mark type, unsurprisingly, is points. And what have we got for visual channels? Well, we've got both the horizontal and the vertical position. And that's what we're using to encode the data. OK, so what tasks are these good for? Well, they're definitely uh, used quite a bit for finding trends, for spotting outliers. Notice how here in the graph in this upper right corner, we've got a clear outlier. That's something that's very easy to spot. Uh, they're good for understanding distributions. Um, and they're really good for finding correlations. Uh, notice how here we have a fairly tightly correlated uh, group here along the diagonal, uh, and they're also good for finding clusters. Now, in terms of scalability, um, again, thinking about about a thousand by a thousand pixels, roughly how many items, that is dots, could we manage to see? Um, hundreds, clearly, at the very least. Um, at some point, we start breaking down in terms of overplotting. Notice how we're getting quite a bit of overplotting in these examples here. Uh, and with too much overplotting, then uh, there's troubles in understanding what's going on. We'll talk about strategies uh, of actually going beyond these sort of base scalability numbers in subsequent weeks as we get to some of the um, questions of things like aggregation, uh, filtering, and a lot of techniques for handling more data uh, than these basic uh, examples. A lot of the scalability analysis that I'll do today is on you know, basic uh, starting point baselines, and then we'll talk about how to go beyond that. All right, so of course, scatter plots must have the two channels of horizontal and spatial, horizontal and vertical spatial position. They could have more, so you can add more channels if you want uh, to encode more attributes. 
Here's a couple examples of um, using color coding. You could size code. One thing to be careful about when you're size coding, uh, if you just take the radius, um, that can be quite misleading because the area is growing quadratically. So typically you would uh, do something like take the square root of the radius since your eye is going to be drawn to the area, uh, even that, though that's not what you are trying to encode. We'll talk quite a bit today about the difference between what you're trying to encode and what people are going to decode when they look at it. And sometimes uh, when there's mismatches there, things can get tricky. You can also shape code. That's what we've got here. We've got some pluses and some circles. Um, and notice how we are completely free to do this because of our mark type is a point. So point marks can be size coded. They can be shape coded. Um, they are the, the most um, easy to extend uh, with other attributes of the mark types because they're completely unconstrained. So what are the tasks the scatter plots are good for? Uh, just to go into a little more detail, uh, heavily, heavily used for correlation. So here's an example of perfect positive correlation, you know, high correlation, still positive, but lower, not at all correlated. Notice how when that's the case, we see sort of roughly even spread in both the directions. And positive correlation is a diagonal going one way, and then uh, negative correlation is a diagonal going the other way. So from low to high to perfect. But they're not just for correlation. Another thing that they are um, heavily used for is cluster detection. So in some cases, what you want to do is simply notice, is there any sort of cluster structure in the scatter plot? Notice how what we have on the left here is uh, essentially no clusters or just one single large cluster, whereas here we've got uh, clearly three clumps. Um, the other thing people are often using scatter plots for is trying to assess whether some sort of known class structure matches up with the cluster structure. They often color code the classes. So here you see we've got red and blue and black class structure that's color coded and it very much matches the cluster structure in the spatial positions. In contrast, here's an example of a scatter plot where we do not have a great match between this coloring according to class and the actual spatial structure. You know, we've got this red dots are in two different uh, clumps. We've got, you know, the, the black are also scattered all about. Um, so that's an example of not actually having that kind of matching. Okay. So our scatter plot was our example of what happens when we have zero keys and we're just expressing quantitative values. What about when we have one or two keys? Well, we typically are doing layouts uh, based on either lists in the one case or a matrix in the two key case. So let's start with one key. Now, here we have to think a little bit about how do we handle categorical information? So we, if we have a categorical attribute, we can use that categorical, categorical attribute to split things up into spatial regions. And so we can separate things into regions, and then we could take those regions and order them and align them. And so when I say region, I just mean, you know, contiguous bounded area distinct from each other. So, you know, one region versus some other region. And what we're doing when we're using regions like this is we are using space to separate. Remember back when we talked about marks and channels, that proximity is a really, really strong perceptual cue. So you tend to associate things that are in the same spatial region. You think of them automatically as being related to each other. So, but also remember when we talked about marks and channels that we had this idea of expressiveness and that we wanted to be careful when we had categorical attributes to be using identity channels um, and that we had this issue that we didn't want to uh, imply things about using ordered attributes that wouldn't be true. So how do we handle this? If we separate things according to a categorical attribute, we must use an ordered attribute to actually take these regions and order them if that is what we want to do. Um, and it's very common once we've ordered regions to actually align them. So let's look at some examples of this. Um, 
Here's an example. Uh, sometimes these are called bubble plots uh, or bubble charts, um, where, well, we've separated things into regions, right? There's actually one of these circles for, uh, in this case, we're looking at um, soccer teams. So these are separated, and each region then has a, a point mark inside of it, size coded point mark. But these are not aligned, right? They're, they're not aligned, you know, vertically or horizontally. Um, they're not ordered in any particular order that we can just read off. And so the, the problem with these kinds of charts is it's actually quite hard to make size comparisons. It's much harder to make size comparisons than if we had aligned position. Let's now look at an example with aligned position. Um, it's much easier to actually tell apart. We probably, in both of these, you could see which one was the biggest, right? Like Manchester United. Um, but, you know, it's hard to tell a bunch of those mid-grade teams apart of, is one a little bit bigger than each other? Um, whereas it's actually much, it's more straightforward to have a comparison of the length, right? Because these are all aligned, all the bars start at the same spot, we're able to easily see exactly nuanced details of which of these bars is longer than the other. So we are able to make length judgments, but it's still actually hard. I mean, of course, again, we can spot Manchester United as the big one, but it's not so easy to find out the fourth biggest one or the seventh biggest one from uh, a view like this. So we're separated and we're aligned, but we're not yet ordered. Once we actually go and have an ordered bar chart where we're actually ordering according to, um, in this case, the same attribute that's being used to length code the bars is now the attribute that we're using to order the bars. And now, of course, it's completely trivial to then say, well, what's the fourth largest uh, down from the top? Um, you know, what's the seventh from the top? So these are things that we can now just very trivially read off. So this is really our best case, a data-driven ordering of a bar chart. So launching into that same idea of a structured analysis, what do we have with a bar chart? Well, we have one key attribute and one value attribute. So in terms of the data, well, we've got one categorical key. We've got one quantitative attribute. Um, our mark type now is lines. We're actually length coding uh, according to this attribute. Uh, and so then what are we doing for the channels? Well, we're expressing a quantitative value with length. Um, you know, these are both vertical bar charts. And then what are we doing to actually draw these bars? Well, we've, we are dividing things up into spatial regions, one for each of these marks. So we've separated them horizontally right here. Um, in this uh, weight chart for some animals, we've got capybara, cat, and wombat. Each one of those is in a spatial region, and so they've been separated, and then they've been aligned so that they all are on the same baseline. And then we have to choose, well, how do we order them? If we just think of animal type in and of itself as something categorical, it doesn't have an intrinsic ordering. We could impose an ordering on it. We could say, well, we're just going to use the label, and we're going to just alphabetically order by label. People, you know, that makes it easy to find things uh, if you know what you're looking for. Uh, but some of the patterns can be harder to see. Whereas if we have that data-driven one, as we just saw, uh, in this case, uh, we can also do it for this much smaller chart. Well, then we can actually have this ordering um, that allows us to understand something more about the intrinsic patterns in the data itself. What are bar charts good for? Well, they're outstanding for doing comparison, right? We can very easily at high resolution compare the heights of these bars uh, and be able to understand uh, relative uh, sizes of things. Um, they're also very good for looking up values. If you actually wanted to read off and say, aha, wombat is looks like that's about 50 pounds on average, that's something that's easy to do from a chart like this. Um, right because we've got the aligned position we can actually have tick marks on the axes so we're able to read that off now let's think about the scale how many bars could we fit in a bar chart um and also how many levels of the um quantitative attribute so in terms of the number of bars again if we have a thousand pixels across 
Well, we can, you know, clearly fit far more than the three we see here. Um, easily dozens, probably up to hundreds even, if we only have maybe a few pixels, very skinny bars for each. So for that categorical key attribute, the number of bars, we can fit from dozens to hundreds. Now, what about for the height of those bars? We can actually fit uh, definitely hundreds of levels for the quantitative attribute because we're able to make these really fine-grained distinctions in heights between the bars. Um, so, you know, up to a thousand levels uh, in the limit of, you know, one pixel difference uh, for the quantitative attribute, uh, the value one, and um, up to hundreds for the key attribute. Now let's take the same idea and we're going to add one more key. So we're going to say, all right, what if now instead of just one categorical attribute, you have two categorical attributes? So we still have the one quantitative attribute. Um, so what are we doing here? We're actually doing something a little bit more complex. We no longer have that simple mark type that we learned about last time with marks and channels. Um, because we've actually, if you look at the stacked bar chart, these segments, each one of those is something we would think of as a mark. So we actually have this composite object, we're going to call that a glyph, where there is internal structure from multiple marks. So in our analysis, what are we doing? Well, we're definitely using length as a channel. Uh, we're using color here, right? We're color coding the different segments of this bar chart. Um, and we've divided up into regions, one for an entire glyph, right? So not just a single mark, but that whole glyph. And let's think about what we have. We've got the, what's aligned is, well, the entire bar, just like its cousin, the normal bar chart, we can actually read off at high precision, the total height of the bar. And we can also read off at high precision, the red components on the bottom there, those are also aligned. And so we can read off very at high precision, the red lower segments. Now, if we look at some of these other segments, the blue ones and the green ones, we are able to look at the length, but because those lengths are not aligned, we're not as able to make that high precision aligned um, length judgment. So we have some of the, the aligned is the entire bar and the lowest component and unaligned length comparisons is what we're doing for those other bar components. Now, one thing that stack bar charts are quite good for is these part to whole relationships. That is, we can see ah, what proportion of the total uh, are each of these bar segments. Um, so we could see, for example, with the banana, it's you know roughly half green, half red, and just a little bit of blue. That's the kind of judgment that's easy to make from a stack bar chart. Now, what I want you to notice about our scalability analysis is there's a real core asymmetry here. So for this stacked key attribute, the one that we're actually using to stack, um, what we're seeing is maybe you could fit, you know, 10 levels, maybe 12. You could not, if you had a, well, for one thing, 100 different colors would be hard to see, as we'll talk about later. But it's just not going to be easy to track if we try to have too many um, different kinds of segments. So we can still, for that main key attribute, just like bar charts, we could have hundreds of bars, but we can't have hundreds of segments. We can have maybe you know somewhere around 10 or so before uh, it's very hard to track across the different bars. All right, let's take something you might not have seen, what's called a stream graph, which is an interesting generalization of uh, stacked bars. Um, and so what it's actually doing with this uh, stream graph idiom is it is emphasizing the horizontal continuity much more than the vertical items. You can see here a sort of uh, a view on the way towards a stacked um, graph of what it would look like to have a stacked bar. Notice how instead of being aligned uh, along a bottom axis, they're actually building out from a middle, a midline. Um, and then it's actually coming up with these shapes, uh, which are really emphasizing this horizontal continuity much more so than uh, the emphasis on vertical and a stacked bar chart. And so what have we got here? Um, so we have one categorical key attribute. 
Uh, in this case, let's imagine that we've got a data set of movies. We've got an, an ordered key attribute, which is going to be the horizontal axis. Uh, in this case, let's assume it's time. And then there's going to be a quantitative value attribute. We'll think of these as counts, like how many people went to see particular movies. Now, what's different here um, is that we've got this derived data. Remember back when we talked about data abstractions, we had this idea that sometimes you would derive geometry. So one thing is we've actually derived the shape of these as something that's explicitly computed algorithmically. Um, we have uh, these, so now we have these layers where the height of this layer is encoding uh, some counts. Um, we also are deriving another quantitative attribute, which is the order that we're drawing these layers in. So let's look at a, um, another one of these examples from the New York Times. And what we're seeing here is a movie data set of, um, from uh, a while ago in 2008. Uh, here we see a Harry Potter movie. Here we see uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, and what's happening here is, I mean, we're, w there's a very clear trend, which is, you know, movies typically make a bunch of money at first and then gradually trickle off. Although in a few cases, there's these multiple bumps, um, like with I Am Legend, we're definitely seeing uh, two humps there. We're also seeing that with the Harry Potter movie. Um, so what's going along here is this is the time axis horizontally, and we can fit maybe hundreds of time keys in terms of the scale. And there's something really different about this one than the previous stacked bars. We could actually fit from dozens to hundreds of these movie keys. There's definitely, there's a few hundred movies being shown here. We don't have room to show the labels for all of these. They've only labeled a few. But what I want you to notice is we're able to see many more of these movie keys than you could with a classic stacked bar, because most of these layers don't extend across the whole chart. Uh, they've got this sort of bursty nature where they start and then they trickle off. And because of that property, we are actually able to um, see with these horizontal layers uh, really quite a few more than we would with a simple stacked bar. All right. We've been talking about bar charts. What about line charts? Another really basic statistical uh, graphic to talk about. Well, there's a way in which they're very similar because they also have this idea that there's one key and one value. Um, but the difference is that we think that not only uh, do we have, in this case, the height as a quantitative attribute, we're also thinking about this horizontal axis as expressing a quantitative attribute. In this case, what we're seeing is time. Um, line charts often, but not always, have time uh, as, as one of their uh, attributes. Now, what's exactly going on at the line chart? They're actually a bit complex. Um, and in some ways, you know, the fact that we call them line charts is a little bit confusing when you think about this kind of analysis, because what's really happening is conceptually, it's you, you have a point mark, um, which is expressing this value. And then, and sometimes people actually just use those and they might call them, you know, dot plots or dot charts. Um, and then what we do is we connect up these points with line segments. And so the, this line nature of the line chart, it's not the same as a bar chart where the line is actually showing directly a value. The line is connecting one value to the next value. So there is this you know, aligned length. Um, and so we're still separating and ordering just like we did with the bar chart. Um, but there's this difference of connecting. So what, what are the implications of this difference? Well, this is really, really, really good for finding trends because these connection marks are actually emphasizing the fact that there is an order to this axis because it's really explicitly showing the relationship between one item like 2006 and another item 2007, in this case, the average weight of my cat. Um, so let's think about scalability. Okay, how many of the key levels, that is, you know, the, in this case, the years across on the axis could we do? Well, again, if we had a thousand pixels, we could definitely fit hundreds um, 
of, of points across in the line chart. And what about the value levels? In this case, you know, the, the exact height of those uh, points. Again, hundreds because we have high precision aligned ability to uh, compare heights. So we're at hundreds of keys and hundreds of values. Now, if there's a sort of structural similarity between bar and line charts, how do we decide when to use which one? And it really depends on the kind of key attribute. If your key attribute is categorical, then it makes sense to use bar charts. And if your key attribute is ordered, then it makes sense to use line charts. Um, violating this principle can really confuse people. So these are actually uh, figures that are um, redrawn from a really cool study by uh, Jeff Zaks and Barbara Tversky, where they tried violating this rule to see what kinds of sort of semantic errors people would make. And so if you use a line chart when your key is categorical and you've just actually violated that expressiveness, princi expressiveness principle that we've talked about, the implication of a trend is so strong in terms of your perceptual system, it can actually override your ability to think about meaning and semantics. So people in the study would literally say things like, um, a thing that would make sense to say is, you know, the older you are, the taller you are. That's a very reasonable thing to say about 12 year olds versus 10 year olds. It's not reasonable to say the more male you are, the taller you are. Like, no, that doesn't actually make sense. There's no such thing as the more male. But if you present the data in this way, it actually leads people to making those kind of statements about the data, um, even though it's actually nonsensical. So be careful when you are uh, graphing data to make reasonable choices uh, and save line charts for um, when your key value is ordered rather than categorical. All right, while we're thinking about charts, um, one important principle, label your axes. So I am going to want you to, uh, when you're actually, you know, in practical uh, use making charts, you know, label your axes. Uh, the fabulous XKCD full of snark and wonderfulness you know, points out, again, labeling axes, you got to do it if you actually want people to value you as a human being. Um, there are a few exceptions. We'll talk uh, in a few weeks about small multiple views, about multiple views. There could be situations where you could have a shared axis label for many graphs uh, if, they're, if the charts are aligned to each other. So that's one possibility. But in general, uh, best practice uh, is that you do want to label your axes. What's another best practice? Well, avoid cropping the y-axis. Um, so in general, what you want to do is actually include zero at the bottom left. Otherwise, you can have a very misleading picture. All uh, right, so here was one taken from a political uh, thing of um, what would the impact of tax cuts be? And you get a very different sense, essentially the slope uh, of one, the height of one bar versus the height of another bar, we can see that it's fairly moderate here. A deceptive way to present this uh, would be to have a y-axis that starts and goes from 34% to 42%. You get a very different of the severity of the tax uh, cut situation with this one than the one on the left. So in general, you want to avoid cropping the y-axis. Um, there's a great paper that just came out this year, Truncating the Y-Axis, Threat or Menace, from uh, uh, Michael Krell, Enrico Bertini, and Steve Franconeri. Um, and they did come up with some examples of, uh, first of all, they found that all kinds of ways to try to mitigate this effect uh, by using careful visual encoding essentially didn't work. People are equally misled, even if you try to carefully visually encode the fact that you have crop the y-axis. There are some examples where you would, it's reasonable to crop it, um, right? Like here's actually the inverse situation where it's deceptive to show this climate data uh, with uh, a zero point. Um, and the really much more honest thing is to show it zoomed in because you're trying to actually understand these small variations. So if things like the zero value is arbitrary, um, because maybe it's something like a temperature 
or if small changes matter, or you want to have an index chart to compare things to an indexed value, these are all some examples of where it could be reasonable to crop the y-axis. What's another thing we could do with charts? Well, we could do what's called a dual axis line chart, where we have um, two axes on either side, and we're trying to actually read the values on both the left and the right axis. Um, be aware that these are somewhat controversial. Uh, some people are quite opposed to them. Others think it's acceptable if you're very careful to do something commensurate with your axes. Um, but the really tricky thing about these is that it's quite possible to mislead by playing around with the min-max of these two axes. Uh, so it's definitely something you want to be careful of. Let's look at an example of a oh, way to go wrong. Again, we're going to grab a political example. This is where people are often uh, have access to grind. Um, here was a very misleading original chart that kind of went down in the Hall of Fame a few years ago as like one of the worst charts of the year. Um, and in this one, it was making an argument about uh, the US Planned Parenthood. And it basically said the amount of cancer screening went down, the amount of abortions went up in a way that made it very much seem like there was some causality there. Uh, and some real uh, severity of just how much change had happened. Now, in that graph, notice how these two arrows actually cross. Here was a redesign of the same data where they're actually saying, you know, these numbers are directly comparable. You could actually say that if you put these numbers on directly comparable axes, you see a very different situation where the increase in abortions was much smaller um, than the decrease in cancer screening. Um, and so the implication that the number of abortions had increased dramatically is actually not borne out by the data. Now, that was a first redesign. An interesting point while we're thinking about redesigns is a second redesign uh, actually points out that these are not the only two services provided by Planned Parenthood. And when you look at the larger picture, you actually see in this case that STD screening had gone way up. So it was true that cancer screening had gone down, but something else had gone up. Whereas if you look in the larger context, the number of abortions were, was roughly flatlined. So this question of what is the slope of the line and is it meaningful is something that you want to think about uh, with line charts. Uh, for those who want to dive in and see more, uh, there's a link to the URL uh, of a blog post from Alberto Cairo, um, a data journalist who's uh, done some very approachable books on visualization. Um, all right, so I, I mentioned this idea of an indexed line chart. Let's actually go back to that and understand that as an idiom. So with an indexed line chart, um, we once again, we have two quantitative attributes, a key and a value, um, but we're going to derive new data. We're going to derive a new quantitative value attribute where we want to, as the name implies, index with respect to a particular value. So we're going to essentially have a baseline value that we're indexing against, and we're going to plot that rather than the original value. So. Here's an example on the right here, where on the top we see a um, standard line chart. And then on the bottom we have, you can think of this as change from the previous year. You're indexed to, in this case, the value uh, of California revenues from the previous year. And so notice how we're now having things go up and down from this baseline, as opposed to, for the most part, increase with the raw data. So, what task is this good for? Well, it's good for showing change over time in a normalized way rather than an absolute way. So this is a theme that's going to come up again um, in different contexts, the idea that sometimes people need to see absolute numbers, but sometimes they need to see relative numbers. Sometimes they want to normalize with respect to something. In this case, it's by the previous year's uh, income. What's the scalability of this? Well, it's basically exactly the same as the standard line chart. We haven't changed anything about the scalability. It's just that by deriving new data, we've changed the meaning of this chart, but not the scalability of the chart. Here's another one for uh, 
tabular data, Gantt charts, uh, especially any of you who've got any sort of project management background might have run into these. So what's going on with these? We still have one key, and then we have two related values. So we have one categorical attribute and two quantitative attributes. And these attributes are basically, we've got the start time and we've got the end time of often some you know, process or task or something like that. And so the length of the line mark is the duration of the task. And notice how with a Gantt chart, we are not aligned. So what we've, we've done here is there is this idea of you have a start time, your horizontal position is start time, and then the duration allows you to also show things directly as having an end time. And the task that this is good for um, is really understanding dependencies between items. When does, for example, one need to end before another can begin? It emphasized temporal overlap. So when are things happening at the same time? Uh, like on this one, task five versus task six. So these are the tasks that Gantt charts are good for. So although we are less able to exactly read off the length of an individual segment, we're able to understand the temporal relationship between these segments more easily. So what's our scalability analysis here? Well, in terms of the number of key levels, that is the number of bars that we want to have and you know the number of tasks, well, this might be perhaps dozens, but the number of value levels, that is how many different durations can you tell apart? Well, definitely hundreds, right? Because again, we've got our thousand by a thousand pixels. So we're able to see very fine grained distinction in durations. We could have you know hundreds of different durations that we're able to tell the difference between but um, without doing some more exotic things, it's going to be difficult to get past maybe dozens of, um, you know, under 100 or so of the bars themselves representing jobs or um, processes. All right, here's another idiom to analyze. Notice how what we're doing is we're just going through and we're taking idioms and we're trying to break them down to understand them in terms of what's happening with marks, uh, what are the different attribute types, what channels are being used, and you know what's the scale. So these are often called slope graphs or slope charts, um, and they're used to try to show rankings that change between, um, in this case, it's two different time periods, uh, a bunch of sports teams, in fact, the same ones we looked at before of uh, soccer data. So what we've got is we've got two quantitative value attributes, um, which might be something like, you know, in this case, it was the number of games won. And then there's a derived attribute, which is basically the magnitude of the change, in this case, from one time point to another, although it doesn't necessarily have to be time, it often is time. And so what are we doing with the visual encoding? Well, the mark, essentially, we can think of it as being one point for each of these two values, and then we draw a connecting mark between those points. So this is really emphasizing that change in rank. So the two vertical positions, I mean, we are just doing that just like with a scatter plot, we're expressing the value of the attribute. Um, you know, in this case, it's the number of games won uh, in 2012 versus in 2013. Um, you can also color code other things. Here we've got whether they improved or uh, got worse as a blue to red coding. So this is sort of essentially a redundant use of color um, because we're able to see, you know, if the slope is positive versus the slope is negative, uh, that matches with the color coding. Um, there's also the use of line width uh, that is size coding in one direction uh, with the uh, thickness of the line. And so in terms of what task this is good for, it's really emphasizing changes in rank, changes in value. We notice when the lines are sloping dramatically. And if there's very little change in rank, then the line is roughly horizontal. OK, again, let's do our scalability analysis. What, what size of things can we do this with? Well, we could have maybe hundreds of levels of value, right? That is fine-grained. Um, 
distinctions between exactly what uh, rank something is. Um, but in terms of the number of items, that is, you know, the number of, of slanted lines we have here, um, it's going to be maybe dozens. Again, there might be some ways to go beyond that, but sort of at the basic level, uh, we can handle probably dozens of these line segments connecting the two points. Um, but the the uh, amount of granularity of exactly where those points could land is probably more like hundreds. Okay, so what I have just done is talked through a bunch of essentially list-oriented spatial layouts um, where there's a base use of a single key. Um, of course, I then also walked through some examples where we had more than one key, um, although it wasn't um, this is being used in quite as independent of a way as we're about to talk about. So we have a bunch where we had one key um, as the base of the spatial layout. Now let's talk about using two keys as the direct base of the spatial layout. So the uh, classic example of a two key approach, uh, which we can think of as a, a matrix layout, uh, is something that looks basically exactly like a matrix. Um, so a heat map is the name of the idiom where we have two keys and then one value. So in this example, uh, this is from biology, where we've got two categorical attributes. Um, along one of these axes are uh, specific different genes and along the other axis is some experimental condition. Um, and then the quantitative attribute, in this case, it's how much a gene is turned on or turned off, that's called the expression level, um, in a particular experimental condition. Um, that's what we see at the intersection of the two. So what we've done is we've got these point marks um, that are separated and aligned in 2D. And so, we use these categorical attributes to index in, um, and then we're able to actually see the value as something that is color-coded. So we're color-coding in some you know, x, y position in the matrix according to some quantitative attribute. We'll talk more about the color uh, later on in a few weeks when we talk about color. I'll just note for the record that this is an ordered diverging color map that we're seeing here where it starts out black and it gets very highly saturated green in one direction, highly saturated red in the other. So what are these good for? Well, they're good for finding clusters and noticing outliers. So here we're able to see, well, there's obviously this big cluster of green in the upper left. Um, you know, there's a few places like here's a little bit of a green that's mostly in a dark region. Um, so, you know, here's some very bright green right next to some very bright red. So this seems like maybe a more uh, outlier situation. So we're able to notice that very easily. Um, now let's think about the scale here. So in the limit, you know, right now I've got these little cells uh, that I'm coloring that are, this is maybe, you know, three, four pixels high, and that's maybe under about 10 pixels across. You can imagine that cell being even smaller, maybe even smaller. In the limit, if we were being very aggressive and we had a thousand by a thousand pixels, and we said, okay, we're gonna have each one of these cells be only a single pixel, then we could fit a million items, right? Because we'd have a thousand by a thousand. So we can fit a very, very large number of items here, substantially larger than uh, things we've talked about so far. Now, let's think about, um, well, these, because remember the item is the combination of a gene and an experimental condition. So what about the number of categorical levels for each of these? Like how many genes could we have? Well, we could have hundreds of genes. We could have hundreds of experimental conditions. And in the limit, we could have, you know, just under a thousand of each of these. But, and here's the thing I want you to notice, we do not have the ability to have this huge number of quantitative attribute levels. I mean, let's look at this picture here. Well, you know, there's the dark parts and then there's sort of, you know, dark green and, you know, moderate green and lighter green and pretty bright green. 
Okay, so that was like maybe four or five. And similarly, you know, maybe there's about four shades of red we can see. So, you know, there's somewhere around 10 different levels of this color coding that we're able to see. So we could have a million items, but we can only have around 10 uh, of these quantitative attribute levels. So big, big, big difference um, in the number of quantitative attribute levels compared to the number of categorical attribute levels. This is the kind of scalability analysis that we really want to think about. It things tend to get interesting when we have asymmetries in what kinds of things we can show. Now, in order to actually make heat maps useful, there's typically some sort of computational reordering that happens with the heat map. Um, here's an example of looking at a heat map where um, we are just using an alphabetical order. Again, this, this is a very common default is if you don't know what to do, you know, you've got some sort of names or labels and you just do them alphabetically. This does not necessarily reveal the true structure of the data. Um, there's a lot of different methods for reordering to try to capture the cluster structure. Um, we're not going to talk about them at length today. We'll talk about them a little bit more um, in an upcoming class. Um, but what I'll say now is that it's um, quite possible to actually try to capture the cluster structure in the cases where we can reorder. Because remember, these are categorical attributes on uh, in this case, it's a, a bunch, it's car data sets. So we're looking like the number of cylinders and the horsepower. These things are not ordered. So we're free to reorder in both the horizontal directions of reordering the columns and the vertical, we can reorder the rows. And so since we can freely reorder, we can then actually capture this cluster structure uh, much more explicitly through computation and then reveal that through the visualization. So it's, very common that if you're looking at heat map data, you are actually reordering it. And then what that can lead to is a sort of augmented idiom, the cluster heat map, where in addition to just showing that heat map, that matrix, we're basically drawing trees on either side um, because we've actually got this derived data where we're showing a, a hierarchical clustering where we're actually seeing um, notice how there we've found some cluster structure already here. So uh, we're explicitly showing the way in which this heat map was reordered by drawing this tree. It's called a dendrogram in this case, this particular kind of tree drawing, um, where we are showing these parent-child relationships with these connection line marks. We'll talk much more about tree drawing in a few weeks. Notice how this tree is drawn so that the leaves, the, the bottom leaves are all aligned. And then that means that you can actually compare the heights uh, above. Uh, so these interior branch heights are what's very easy to compare. You probably have often seen trees that are more the other way. You start from the root and then the leaves end up at different heights. This is the inverse where we start with all the leaves at the same height and then work our way up to the root. And that's what's common with these so-called dendrograms, because we're really trying to show the cluster structure that was used to order the heat map. So in general, when people are looking at these kinds of um, encodings, typically what they're trying to say is, well, you ran some algorithm to try to come up with a clustering and thus an ordering, and you're often wanting to assess the quality of clusters that were found by these automatic methods and make judgments about whether you think um, the adequate structure in the data is being captured by the ordering. All right, so we've been talking so far about situations where we have rectilinear arrangement of axes, right? Where we're saying, okay, we've got a vertical and we've got a horizontal, but that's not the only possibility. Let's now move on and talk a bit about radial layouts and what's involved in those. So let's start with the radial equivalence of a bar chart. So a radial bar chart or a star plot. Um, these are the same basic idea uh, with a star plot. You've got a line mark and you've got these radial axes that are meeting at a central point or with a radial bar chart. You've again got a line mark and then you've got a central ring. Uh, so they're not going all the way to the center, but they're arranged in a ring. And in both of these, what's going on? 
well, we're obviously length coding something, right? There's, there's a length coding going on here, but we aren't aligned, you know, horizontally or vertically. We're actually wrapped around radially. So we've got this idea that there are radial axes. What are we doing? We're using the angle or the orientation or the tilt, right? We're using that channel that's actually about going around. So what are the pros and cons of using a radial um, layout versus a horizontal or vertical layout? Now, from a mathematical point of view, you could say, oh, well, you know, it's sort of easy to see how you could transform a bar chart into one of these radial bar charts. Um, so, you know, mathematically they're equivalent, but perceptually they are not equivalent at all. This is where we get into the part where the human perceptual system has this huge impact. So it is much less easy to determine whether two things are the same length or different lengths in these radial layouts than with that aligned one. So we are less able to perceive these. Um, we're not unable, but we are less able. So our accuracy is less uh, with these sort of radial charts than with the uh, rectilinear. So, you know, there's other idioms of this type, like a radar plot is basically the radial version of a line chart. Uh, you still have this idea of point marks, but instead of having things along a, hor a horizontal or vertically aligned axis, we're sort of going all the way around. And then we're taking these points and we're connecting them up by line marks. So this is like a number of uh, line charts all superimposed on top of each other. Now, there's some problems with this. It's usually considered best to avoid this unless you have data that is intrinsically cyclic. So here we have that same soccer team data, which is not intrinsically cyclic. Uh, of course, what we can do is we can, you know, take these and have them in alphabetical order around the uh, outside of the circle, but the data is not intrinsically ordered. Um, but this kind of a layout sort of strongly implies that it is. So there's this expressivity mismatch. Um, in general, uh, although this is somewhat contentious, but many people argue, uh, some might give you different numbers, but you know, avoid them 99.9% .9 of the time was one of the arguments that Alberto Cairo made. Um, here's another example of a redesign. So here was a, uh, a newspaper graphic um, from about 10 years ago where it was given a radar chart. Um, and he argues that uh, this redesign, which is same data, but in a rectilinear chart is actually easier to see important aspects of the structure uh, compared to this uh, radar chart. So in general, you want to think carefully about when would it be legitimate to actually show something radially. Typically, you do that when there is some intrinsically cyclic nature to the data. And if there's not, then think very, very carefully about whether you actually want to use radial layouts. Which brings us to the pie chart. So. A lot of visualization people love to hate pie charts. Um, let's understand a bit about why. What, why are pie charts often critiqued? So what is a pie chart? Well, a pie chart, what exactly have we got here? What kind of marks are these even? The one thing we're probably pretty sure about is, well, they're not point marks. There's definitely, there's something going on with a length, uh, or is it length coding? Is it angle coding? So let's think about what these marks are. We've definitely got an, some sort of angle, right? The, uh, the sector of the pi, uh, we actually are traversing along in the angle here. And so we actually have uniform height or uniform length, right? Going from the center part out towards the outside of the circle, that's uniform across this chart. What varies is this angle here. So there's a way in which we can sort of see the relationship between the pie chart and then this bar chart. Um, and we can see that things that are these, you know, very clear up and down lines in the bar chart 
are corresponding to these variable width sectors in the pie chart. Now, you might see this coming, we are much less accurately able to actually see the width of these angles compared to the height of these bars. It is less accurately able to be perceived. There's actually another chart type, um, sometimes called the coxcomb chart, which is sort of even a more direct analog to a bar chart. And you can think of this as sort of going the other way from the pie chart. The pie chart had uniform length and variable width according to how far along you were. Coxcomb is a variable length um, and uniform width. So each one of these sectors is equally spaced in angle space, the width, uh, and then the length changes. So this is sort of very much more obviously the radial version of a bar chart uh, where you've just taken this horizontal axis here and sort of wrapped it around itself. Um, now, in all of these cases, what's the data? Well, it's a categorical key attribute and it's a quantitative value attribute. So we have the same kind of data as we do in a bar chart, but the layout is different. Now, what are these good for? It's part to whole judgments. So if you want to understand how the parts add up to the whole, you know, there is a way in which you could say, oh, well, maybe it's a little easier to understand that with a pie chart than just with a bar chart, because all of these pies, of course, sum up to 100% of the way around. And that's something that doesn't jump out at you from the bar chart. So if what you really need to do is understand part to whole judgments, that would be the use case for um, these kinds of charts. I'll mention that this coxcomb plot, sometimes it's known as the nightingale rose or more prosaically, the polar area chart. Um, and that's because it was actually invented by Florence Nightingale um, who used it to try to understand the causes of mortality um, back in uh, Civil War times. She definitely had a point she was trying to make about um, disease being a major cause of mortality rather than direct uh, war. Um, and that's something that is emphasized by this particular chart. Now, let's actually go back and think, you know, we talked about marks and channels last week. What exactly is going on with these coxcomb charts? And it's tricky because what's being encoded, right, is you're using length and you're using angle. But here's why these can be pretty confusing. What's being decoded by your eyes, right, what your perceptual system is doing is you're really noticing the area of these. But that's not what's being encoded. So we have this problem, which is that because these sectors are, um, They've got non-linear, non-uniform, uh, the, the widths are non-uniform. So the ones that are really close to the center, um, you don't see very much ink. And the ones that get you know, much longer and further out, you actually see much more. So these sector widths are not uniform. And so what that means is that the variation in area is not linear with respect to the length of the line mark. And in contrast, what's going on with a rectilinear bar chart? Well, it's safe because this width is uniform. So the area is linear. So basically the thing you're encoding, which is actually the length of the line mark, you now have this linear relationship between that and the area. And so you're much more able to get a um, uniform perception where the area matches with the length, whereas here the area really varies highly with the links. And that's one reason why this plot is difficult to understand. So you might wonder, well, are these area marks? Because after all, what I'm seeing is area. But notice how these are just directly the analogs of these line marks. Uh, so I will argue that the, the useful way to think about these is they are line marks, but that they have these non-uniform widths that make them really hard to understand because your brain wants to interpret them as area marks, but what you're encoding is actually with lines. 
while we're thinking about perception, what's going on with pie charts? So people have actually done some empirical studies on this uh, relatively recently. Um, and they their current guess is that what people are actually responding to is the arc length around the circumference of the circle. Um, and they have some pretty compelling evidence that what you're actually decoding and perceiving through some careful experiments is not, in fact, the angle. Um, it might be the area, but it's, uh, it's looking like it's likely that it's actually the arc length. Um, and one interesting follow-on is this, is that whatever the situation is for pie charts, donut charts, which are basically like pie charts with a hole removed from the middle, are, are no worse than pie charts. Um, it's not clear that they're much better, uh, but they're definitely not worse. So that's just another variant of the pie chart. And they did some careful experiments to try to understand whether when they just gave you angle information, then the error rates were much higher uh, than when they actually showed you a full-on uh, donut chart or pie chart. OK, so what are best practices for pie charts? So if you just, especially if you only have two levels, like if you have a very few, and especially two is the sweet spot, then it can be actually quite reasonable for that part to whole task. Um, you know, here we're really able to have jump out at us. You know, obviously, you know, the blue is definitely way more than halfway. There's the gray. That thing is something that you're able to read off reasonably well. Where they're really not very good is if there are several levels, so not just two levels, but what if there's several? If the details matter, um, pie charts are not very good for this. Uh, here's a sort of very clear example where, you know, basically you look at these three pie charts and they look really very, very similar. It's pretty hard to tell things apart with what's going on with the width of these five different sectors. When you look at the bar chart version, it's incredibly obvious what's going on, right? Here you've got this sort of gradual increasing trend. Here, you know, they're roughly all the same. Here you've got a decreasing trend in that other direction with the colors in the same order. So you can't see that in this pie chart. It's just impossible to see this phenomenon that just jumps out at you from the bar chart. So be very careful in general if you've got a lot of levels. Um, think very carefully before using a bar chart. And then if you have a lot of levels, do not do this. Don't go there. This is terrible, right? So here's the what not to do example. You know, this is not effective. This is something that would make much more sense as, for example, a bar chart. OK, but what if you really did want to get at that part to whole relationship? What could we do? Because a bar chart alone doesn't actually communicate the part to whole. Um, one possibility is normalized stack bar charts. So for this part to whole task, we've already talked about a stacked bar chart. That's actually what we're seeing here on the top. And a normalized stacked bar chart is where we take this and we take the full vertical height and we normalize by that. We divide through by that um, so that these all actually go up to the same thing. And now we're able to sort of read off these part to whole relationships uh, quite clearly from the normalized stack bar. What I want you to notice is a single stacked bar is equivalent to an entire full pie chart, and it uses far fewer pixels. So this is a really high information density way of encoding that. Um, you know, it would take a lot more pixels to show 50 of these pie charts than it does to show 50 of these stacked bars. OK, so very different information density between these two approaches. So we spent a lot of time talking about the problems with radial layouts, but what are they good for? They do, in fact, have some strengths. So there's a lot of situations where you should be careful, um, but where, where do they shine? So here's a nice paper on a technique they called glyph maps. Uh, this is by uh, Wickham et al. Uh, this is actually the same Hadley Wickham, those of you who've heard of R and uh, the tidyverse and ggplot. Uh, he's the same person who built that. Now, on the top here, we see some rectilinear charts, and it's incredibly obvious when something is linear uh, 
versus this curvy nonlinear. Um, so that's really, really clear. But you know, what do we see with these last four? Yeah, we sort of see these like sine wave squiggle things. It, it's sort of hard to usefully tell them apart. Now, in contrast, radial is really, really good for interpreting cyclic patterns and like evaluating, you know, periodicity. So, you know, maybe the difference between all these sort of almost circles isn't so clear. We can't easily, it doesn't jump out at us the difference between nonlinear and linear here, like it did with the rectilinear. But it's fantastic for noticing, hey, did we make it all the way around? Are we just a little bit shy? Are we just a little bit past? So the exact relationship between where it started, you know, and then came back around 360 degrees later, this is very easy to read off from the radial one. So radial data in general is good when you're dealing with cyclic patterns. What could be some cyclic patterns? Time very often is if you've got something like, you know, annual data or weekly or monthly. Um, sometimes it's, you know, spatial directions, like the direction that the wind is coming from is an, another example of something that's intrinsically cyclic data. Okay, so we've just talked about radial versus rectilinear. What about this other option, this third one here about parallel? What's, what's that mean? So one idiom, uh, SPLOM, SPLOM stands for a scatter plot matrix. Um, this is basically saying, well, we could have a bunch of scatter plots. Now these are definitely rectilinear. Um, and what if instead of just having two attributes, well, we have a lot of them, right? What if we have five or six or seven? Um, well, what we could do is we could make a scatter plot for every pairwise combination of attributes. So, and that's not actually what we're seeing here. Um, we're looking at a data set of abalone. And there's nine attributes in total. And so we make a little scatter plot for each pairwise combination of these. And let's think about the scalability of this. So, well, we've got rectilinear axes, we've got point marks. <clears throat> And we're making one scatter plot for every possible pair of axes. And so, well, you know, maybe we can handle up to maybe about a dozen at, of these attributes, right? That would give us 144 little um, uh, scatter plots, or actually maybe half that if we only need to look at uh, half of the triangular matrix. And since each one of these scatter plots is not going to be very large, we can only, you know, dozens of items is manageable, maybe a small number of hundreds. But remember that when I talk about a scalability analysis with a thousand by a thousand pixels, that's for the whole thing. So not a thousand by a thousand pixels for one of these scatter plots, but for the entire, entire SPLOM where we have to fit in the many scatter plots. So because that's the scale we're thinking about, um, we're not, you know, if we had a dozen attributes, we couldn't have thousands of items in each of them. We wouldn't be able to see the small dots. So what's an alternative? Well, you know, this sort of fundamental limitation of the scatter plot, right? We have this idea that we have one axis and then the other axis. And, you know, these two axes, well, we've just, in the two dimensional plane, that's, you know, this, the computer screen, we, we've just run out of places to go. Um, you know, we'll talk later on in the term about some of the challenges of a three-dimensional uh, layout as opposed to just a two-dimensional one, but our ability to see things in high precision is confined to that two-dimensional one. So what else could we do? Here we've got a simple example. We've got these scatter plots where we're looking at uh, someone's grades in you know, four subjects, math, physics, dance, and drama. Here we've got the data in tabular form uh, with some color coding just so we can sort of try to look at this and understand what's going on. So the alternative would be, what if you could line the axes up in parallel to each other and you wouldn't have to stop at two or three or four or five. You could keep going. And so the idea with parallel coordinates is that you are encoding something which is a point 
across multiple scatter plots in the SPLOM. Instead, you're encoding that as a jagged series of line segments. So here we have this red person here where their mass score is 85. And then on the physics axis, we go up a little bit to 95 and then down 70 to dance and then down even further for drama. And we connect those points together with connecting line segments. So we get this jagged crooked line, uh, which represents one item. So jagged line for each item. Um, we have uh, a challenge. One challenge is, well, what order should these axes be in? Uh, and that has a really strong implication on what kinds of patterns you're able to see. Um, but it's worth thinking about the scalability of this approach. So we can have dozens of attributes. We can definitely have more than 12, which was our previously stated limit for the scatterplot matrix. So we can scale to a larger number of attributes with parallel coordinates than we could with the scatterplot matrix. And let's think about, well, how many items, how many of these jagged lines could we have? We could probably go up to, say, hundreds. Um, once we got to thousands, we'd probably get so much overplotting it would be hard to see anything. And again, we'll talk more about some strategies for handling that in later classes. But for the base level, we see that we're able to scale to more attributes with parallel coordinates than with scatterplot matrices. OK, so what can we do with these? Well, it is possible to use parallel coordinates to directly read off correlation. So remember that with the familiar scatter plots, you probably are aware of the idea that positive correlation is uh, diagonal one way, negative correlation is diagonal the other way, and uncorrelated, you get this sort of C uh, of points with, without much linear structure. With parallel coordinates, there's an asymmetry. So let's look at this top example. When you have perfect positive correlation, you have these line segments that are all uh, parallel to each other. And then you start getting more and more crossings. Um, uncorrelated are these very scattered crossings in the middle here. And then perfect negative correlation, you actually have this crossover point where all these line segments, you know, this one that was a high value here, we follow this line and we get to a very low value there on axis G. And so they actually all meet at a point halfway in between the two axes. And that shows perfect negative correlation. So very different visual structure, but does still convey uh, this idea of correlation. <clears throat> so the big limitation for parallel coordinates is it's we can see, like in this case, it's a car data set, cylinders versus displacement. We can see some really clear relationship, but it's much harder to say, you know, cylinders compared to gas mileage, because uh, we'd have to try to trace a line as it goes through these different axes. So you're really able to see patterns between neighboring axis pairs. Um, and then the question is, well, how would you pick the axis order? Uh, typically, what a lot of these systems allow is they allow you to interactively reorder axes. Um, and uh, of course, anytime you have interactive exploration, it's both powerful and problematic because the human has to actually go and search through many alternatives. Uh, so we'll talk uh, more in some upcoming classes about some of the challenges of uh, and benefits of interaction. Um, people have proposed algorithms to order axes, just like there are algorithms to reorder heat maps. Um, none of them fully uh, solve the problem. Uh, like many other uh, situations, you've got something that's uh, you know, in, in NP, and then you end up with some heuristics, and you try to find some you know, reasonable rules of thumb. Those are exactly the kinds of situations where you really benefit from visualization to see that because there's not just a sort of trivial algorithmic solution. So we've talked about some of the limitations uh, of, well, with rectilinear, although it's you know very, very familiar and easy to think about, you've got this problem of how many axes, that is attributes, can you scale up to? You know, no problem with two, three actually has challenges we'll be talking about. And as you go to four or more, it's impossible within a single um, plot. You can have multiples like we did for the scatterplot matrix, but you've hit this wall. 
With parallel coordinates, you don't hit that wall. You can go to a much larger number, but they're unfamiliar to most people. You have to actually uh, consider training time to train people in how to interpret this visual encoding. And then with the radial layouts, there are these fundamental perceptual limits. Um, that asymmetry, which is that we are much less precisely able to read off angles compared to length, is one thing to worry about. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this idea that there's a non-uniform sector width that see how this one closer to the center um, actually has uh, a smaller size than this one that is further out from the center in red um, because it's further out. So although we talked about the idea that that's a problem, um, you could actually turn that around and say, oh, there's situations where I actually want to exploit that property you might have two attributes and one is much more important than the other. And so you could make choices about which one to map to length versus which one to map to radial position uh, if you want to actually exploit that asymmetry. OK, one more idea. We're going to think a little bit about layout density. Um, dense. Uh, we're going to wait and talk more about space filling later. But for today, let's just talk about the density of layout. Um, so here's an example um, where people have taken computer code uh, and they're trying to have a very information dense way of uh, showing you some quantitative attribute uh, that is actually mapped to each line of code. So in this case, what they've done is they've taken textual data, in this, in this case, it's source code, um, and each line has an attribute associated with it. In this particular picture, it's, it's test coverage. Um, so for each line, you have test coverage, and then you derive new data. You make a one pixel high line. So you don't actually have readable uh, program code anymore. But you have the length of this one pixel high wide, uh, one pixel high line. Um, the width is the the actual you know width and characters that that line would be mapped into a line. So we start to sort of see the structure of what the code looks like. If you want to look in detail, you know here's a little code view that's only showing you a few lines at a time. But the goal of this part of the system is to actually show you this overview, and so they're color coding according to that attribute. Um, again, test coverage. And what's interesting about this is you can actually fit something like, you know, over 10,000 lines of code within a single screen. Um, obviously, you can't read that code, but you can see these large scale patterns of where was there good coverage or OK coverage or terrible no coverage. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can see in an approach like this. And the main idea I just want you to, to leave with is this idea that there are approaches that really try to maximize as much as possible the information density. Um, I'll talk more about space filling uh, in an upcoming class. So what we've now done is we've really walked through these ideas about how to arrange things spatially for tabular data. We've actually brought up a lot of ideas that will also pertain to both network data and spatial data. Um, we sort of brought it all up while we were talking about tables to get that you know, mental picture of how it all fits together. Um, and so we will certainly be reusing this ideas with the other two data types. What we really focused on today was the idea that you could, if you have quantitative values, you can just express them directly. If you have categorical attributes, you'll often have to separate into spatial regions, make some choices about what attribute to use for ordering, uh, and also for aligning. Now, we didn't just talk about the arrangement of space. We also talked about the idea of how many keys do you have, the different kinds of access orientation, rectilinear, parallel, or radial, and this idea of uh, dense layouts. So that got us started on this big set of design choices about how to visually encode data. So we've made it through one uh, part of this idea of visually encoding um, by arranging things spatially. And then we'll get to some other ways uh, of using 
either spatial data or a number of other visual channels over the next few weeks. All right, and credits. Uh, this material is in chapter seven of the VAD book uh, and some ideas from Alex Lux and Mariah Myers, uh, Utah Database Course, and Ben Jones uh, from the University of Washington and Tableau. All right, signing off for now.